The Nature of Personal Reality, a Seth book by Jane Roberts, Chapter 4. Session 620, October 11, 1972, 10 p.m., Wednesday. Session 620, October 11, 1972, 10 p.m., Wednesday. We will then resume dictation. Your beliefs generate emotion. It is somewhat fashionable to place feelings above conscious thoughts, the idea being that emotions are more basic and natural than conscious reasoning is. The two actually go together, but your conscious thinking largely determines your emotions and not the other way around. Your beliefs generate the appropriate emotion that is implied. A long period of inner depression does not just come upon you. Your emotions do not betray you. Instead, over a period of time you have been consciously entertaining negative beliefs that then generate the strong feelings of despondency. If emotion could be trusted above conscious reasoning, then there would be little point in aware thought at all. You would not need it. You are not at the mercy of your emotions, either, for they are meant to follow the flow of your reasoning. Your mind is meant to perceive the physical environment clearly, and its judgments about the environment then activate the body's mechanisms to bring about proper response. If your beliefs about existence are fearful, then the emotional reactions will be those leading to stress. Your own value judgments need examination in such a case. Your imagination, of course, fires your emotions, and it also follows your beliefs faithfully. As you think so, you feel, and not the other way around. Later we will have some comments regarding hypnotism. Here let me mention that in those terms you hypnotize yourself constantly with your own conscious thoughts and suggestions. The term hypnosis merely implies to a quite normal state in which you concentrate your attention, narrowing your focus to a particular area of thought or belief. You concentrate with great vigor upon one idea, usually to the exclusion of all others. It is a quite conscious performance. As such, it also portrays the importance of belief. For using hypnosis, you force feed a belief to yourself or one given to you by another, a hypnotist. But you concentrate all of your attention upon the idea presented. Here, as in normal life, your emotions and actions follow your beliefs. If you believe you are sick, then for all intents and purposes, you are sick. If you believe that you are healthy, then you are healthy. There is much written about the nature of healing, and there will be material in this book dealing with it. But there is also healing in reverse, in which case an individual loses a belief in his or her health and accepts instead the idea of personal illness. Here the belief itself will generate the negative emotions that will, indeed, bring about a physical or emotional illness. The imagination will follow, painting dire mental pictures of a particular condition. Before long, physical data bears out the negative belief negative in that it is far less desirable than a concept of health. I mention this here simply because in the overall development of an individual, an illness may also be used as a method to achieve another constructive end. In such a case, belief would also be involved. Such a person would have to believe that an unhealthy condition was the best way to serve another purpose. Other means would seem close to him because of various personal beliefs that would form a vacuum in his experience. That is, he would see no other way, perhaps, to achieve the same end. 
This will be discussed much more thoroughly later in the book. One belief, of course, can be dependent upon many others, each generating its own emotion and imaginative reality. The belief in illness itself depends upon a belief in human unworthiness, guilt and imperfection, for example. The mind does not hold just active beliefs, it contains many others in a passive state. These lie latent, ready to be focused upon and used. Any of them can be brought to the fore when a conscious thought acts as a stimulus. If you are focusing upon ideas of poverty, illness, or lack, for example, your conscious mind also holds latently concepts of health, vigor, and abundance. If you divert your thoughts from the negative ideas to the positive ones, then your concentration will begin to alter the balance. The vast reservoir of energy and potential within you is called into action under the leadership of your conscious mind. Because you are reasoning creatures, because you have available such varieties of experience, the human species developed reasoning abilities that are meant to evolve and grow as they are used. Your consciousness expands as you use it. You become more conscious as you exercise these faculties. A flower cannot write a poem about itself. You can, and in doing so, your own consciousness turns around about itself. It literally becomes more than it was. Existing in such diversified, rich environment possibilities, the human psyche needed and developed a conscious mind that could make fairly concise and accurate minute-by-minute -minute judgments and evaluations. As the conscious mind grew now, so did the range of imagination. The conscious mind is a vehicle for the imagination in many ways. The greater its knowledge, the further the reach of imagination. In return, imagination enriches conscious reasoning and emotional experience. You have not learned to use your consciousness properly or fully so that it seems that imagination, emotions, and a reasoning are separate faculties or sometimes set against each other. The mature conscious mind, once more, accepts data from the exterior world and from the interior one. It is only when you believe that consciousness must be attuned only to exterior conditions that you force it to cut itself off from inner knowledge intuitional voices and the depths from which it springs. You may take your break. End session. Peace, light, and love. Aloha.